Hi everybody, Pete Sardis for The Lawyer You Know. Today, we are gonna talk about how Elizabeth Holmes is gonna go to federal prison and what it's gonna be like for her. But before we do that, as always, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you're enjoying the series, please subscribe to our channel. And as always, please leave me questions and comments in the section below so that I know what interests you. Specifically, now that we're getting to the close of this particular case, if there are any other legal topics that you find interesting, please let me know what they are because if I get enough people that give me the same legal topic, we'll go ahead and do a series on that also. All right, so. How does one get to federal prison? There are two ways realistically. The first way, which is the normal way, is at sentencing, the judge will remand a defendant to the Bureau of Prisons and have the marshals take them into custody and transport them from wherever they, whatever courthouse they're at to a local jail. And then from that point, they will go to whatever federal prison that they're assigned to. There is a second way that is really most prevalent for white collar type folks, and that's called self-surrender. What self-surrender means is that the judge leaves you out on bond until you report to federal prison. And at some point you'll get a um, either a letter in the mail or a phone call from the U.S. Marshal Service and it'll tell you, show up to this facility on this day at this time, at which point you go to prison. So what happens? So you walk in the front door, literally, if you're gonna do self-surrender, which is what Elizabeth Holmes most likely will do. And I say most likely, because there's no guarantee, but normally white collar defendants uh, that have been out on bond pre-trial and that are also out on bond after conviction, most likely the judge is going to allow her to self-surrender. It's kind of a big deal if you look at the, one of the videos we did previously about how the Bureau of Prisons calculate somebody's classification score, allowing a defendant to self-surrender actually decreases their potential classification by three points, meaning it is very favorable if you can self-surrender uh, self surrender to a prison. All right, so what happens when you go to prison? Well, it's kind of like the first day of school. Uh, you're going to be given an in-processing uh, period. And what happens at that in-processing is you're given written materials that talk about the way your specific institution is going to operate. For example, the ins and outs of how the, this particular prison works. You'll be provided information about all the program availability in that institution. For example, GED college courses. Do they have, uh, you know, uh, training for various trades? Do they have counseling for drug dependency and things like that? You get to know all of the available programs. In addition, the Bureau of Prisons will give you a binder that talks about your rights and responsibilities as an inmate. Along with that, you'll receive the formal process for inmate discipline and in the alternative, the formal process for inmate grievances. What do I mean by that? The Bureau of Prisons, especially the prisons themselves, have a little mini judicial system inside. The prison will give you the rules, and if you break the rules, you are subject to being disciplined. Everything from you know, having some of your privileges revoked or reduced, all the way to potentially being reclassified to a different prison. On the other side, there is also a grievance procedure. And what that means is that as an inmate, if you feel that you're part of, uh, the, okay, as an inmate, if you feel that something is happening that shouldn't be happening, you have the right to report that. And normally either the warden, the grievance committee, or your case manager, who we'll talk about in a second, will make a decision about whether or not, you know, something should be done in order to redress whatever grievance you have. You know, the process works relatively well uh, and it gives inmates an opportunity to say, hey, this isn't right, this is what happened, this is why, and I'd like some sort of, uh, you know, resolution on this. Speaking of your case manager, the next thing that will happen after you get all of your documents is you will actually get to meet the teacher. You get to meet the staff at the prison. Normally the warden will say a couple of kind words. You'll meet your case manager who will be the person to whom the inmate will go to with specific concerns. Uh, that is the person that will follow them basically throughout their prison sentence to make sure that they're getting their time classification or their gain time is what we call it. And we'll talk about that in a moment to make sure that their programs are being uh, are being properly assessed to them to make sure that you know they need all that their that their housing needs are being met. That is the person we call the case manager. You also get to meet the medical staff and whatever other individuals you may need to have contact with. For example, if there's mental health counseling that's going to be assigned to you, 
uh, then you'll get to meet those mental health counselors. So you meet the staff. Okay, what happens next? Clothing. There is no civilian clothing allowed in prison. Uh, what they will do is, if you've ever seen the Blues Brothers, uh, when Jake uh, is leaving prison, they actually open up the bag and they hand him all of his clothes back. It's kind of the opposite of that when you go to prison. The prison will take your, uh, your civilian clothes and they will then issue you prison wear. Uh, they will um, inventory you know, your socks, your pants, your shirt. If you brought a watch, they'll inventory that. If you have a wedding ring, there are only a few things that you are allowed to have. And it normally uh, revolves around religious items. For example, if you're wearing a chain around your neck with a cross or something like that, you're allowed to have it. Other than that, you'll also be given some basic hygiene equipment and bedding. Let's talk for a moment about the clothing that is issued the Bureau of Prisons. Here's what it looks like for the most part. Four pair of khaki pants, four pair of khaki button-up shirts, four t-shirts, four pairs of socks, four pairs of underwear. You kind of see where I'm going with this. One belt buckle, one pair of shoes, four bath towels, four washcloths, two blankets, two sheets, one pillow, one pillowcase, and a laundry bag. And that is what you're given. Now, you have the opportunity to purchase at the commissary other clothing that has been approved by the Bureau of Prisons. For example, you can buy certain types of tennis shoes, you can buy sweatpants, things like that. And again, those are approved by the Bureau of Prisons and are available for purchase. But presuming you don't have any money and presuming nobody put any money in your commissary account, the Bureau of Prisons will provide you basic clothing for the time that you spend in the Bureau of Prisons. So next, when you go to the commissary, and if you remember from our previous videos, uh, the commissary is the mini mart inside of the prison where you can buy sundry things, you know, things that have been approved by the Bureau of Prisons that are, you know, available for uh, inmates for the course of the time that they're at the Bureau of Prisons. Obviously, there is a medical portion of the uh, in-processing, which means everybody's kind of evaluated to make sure that the Bureau of Prisons knows any health needs that a specific person has. If you require medication, they make sure they have your medication or more likely than not, the generic version of your medication so that you can get your blood pressure pills or whatever you might happen to need. Everything uh, is provided by the Bureau of Prisons. Now, Female inmates are screened for pregnancy the minute they get to the Bureau of Prisons because normally if someone is pregnant while when they get to the Bureau of Prisons, the prisons will make arrangements for that baby to have prenatal care and to be born normally at a local hospital. They don't normally do birthings at the medical facility in the um, uh, in the prison unless it's absolutely an emergency. Normally they'll send you out to like a real hospital to have a baby. After that, uh, the staff helps people place the baby with friends, family members, you know, somebody outside of the prison because you obviously can't raise a baby while you're incarcerated. Other than that, uh, the staff assists you know, in making arrangements too. For example, for the time, the few months after birth, they'll put you in a facility so you can you know, breastfeed or just bond with your baby. All of that, again, is done through the Bureau of Prisons and it's determined at the time that you come into the facility. If you're pregnant, obviously, they'll make those things happen. There is an evaluation that is done on every inmate and an evaluation for everything that could potentially be an issue for you or given or provided to you at the Bureau of Prisons. You're evaluated for your education. You're evaluated for vocational programs. If you recall, we talked about Unicor jobs uh, in some videos previously. You're evaluated to see if you qualify for any of those positions. And since we're talking about Unicor, I had some questions about how much people get paid in prison. I went and pulled the actual official pay rate and it's anywhere from 23 cents to $1.35 per hour, depending on the grade of work and the complexity of the work that you're doing. So that's how much you get paid to work inside of the prison. Other than that, um, they also evaluate you for counseling, rehabilitation services, psychological services like behavioral counseling, drug abuse screening. They have programs for emotional growth. They have mental health programs. Uh, there are even special programs designed for women to address trauma-related mental health issues. Normally, if you participate in a program like that, basically battered spouse syndrome, does that sound familiar? Uh, you'll participate in that program in the first year of your incarceration. It's a 40-week program. There is a good chance that Elizabeth Holmes might be tagged for this program based on her testimony at trial about being subservient or being, you know, um, 
uh, mentally or emotionally, physically abused by Sonny Balwani. So I'm guessing you're going to see her assigned to that type of program. After that, they identify your housing, where you're actually going to stay. Um, for our purposes, again, if you recall, we did a video a couple couple weeks ago about the housing in minimum and low security prisons. I'm guessing that Elizabeth Holmes is going to be assigned to some sort of a dormitory setting. It'll probably be some sort of a cubicle. Inside of that cubicle will be either you know, somewhere between two and four people, and each of them will have a bunk and they'll have a locker. The Bureau of Prisons will assign you a locker. They don't necessarily assign you a specific bunk. Uh, the roommates pretty much make those determinations on their own, but you know they'll at least tell you this is going to be the place where you're going to sleep for the rest of the time that you're at Bureau of Prisons. So after the initial assessments and evaluations, which by the way don't happen in one day, I mean you can be in in processing for as much as 30 days. You will then actually go to the housing unit at the Bureau of Prisons, where things are very regimented to say the least. Even in a minimum security prison. There are specific times where everything happens. Everything is a clock. You live and die by the clock. And let me give you an idea about the actual schedule for a minimum and low facility in the Bureau of Prisons. Now, are these set in stone? No, every facility has the opportunity to make changes if they wanna modify something, but this is generally the schedule for prisoners at minimum and low security prisons. Wake up at 6 a.m., breakfast is at 7. You go to work between the hours of 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. At 11 o'clock, you have a 30-minute lunch. Once 30-minute lunch is over, you go back to work from noon till about 3 p.m. Your off-duty time, meaning personal time, starts at about 4 o'clock, and that happens until 5 o'clock when you have dinner. Dinner is for a half an hour, at which point you then have religious and specialized programs between the hours of six and seven. Everybody has to be back in their dorm room by 8 p.m., at which part you're in your housing unit. Uh, again, free time from 8 p.m. until 10 p.m., and then lights out is at 11. And when I say lights out, I literally mean they push the button and all the lights go off except for the security lighting inside of the facility. That's it, every day, seven days a week. That is your schedule. Smoking is prohibited in all federal institutions. So uh, if you're going to prison, I would suggest to get some Nicorette in advance because you're not gonna be allowed to smoke anywhere on the grounds of the Bureau of Prisons. All right, so now that you know the schedule, let's talk for a second about just daily life. Let me start with meals. Again, all meals are provided by the Bureau of Prisons and they are what I would consider normal cafeteria style food. You've got hamburgers, hot dogs, uh, you know, chicken, you have some facilities have salad bars, uh, you know, mashed potatoes, things like that. It, it's all based on the Bureau of Prisons requirements for calorie counts and, um, and nutritional value. So there's regular food there. Dare I say, I would stress to you that the food is probably similar to what you'd see in basic training at a military facility. I, I wouldn't, I don't want to you know, make anybody upset with that, but I wouldn't presume that it's much different uh, in, in that regard. Now, you get one meal. You actually have your, your ID tag that you're assigned and you'll scan for your meal. You get one serving, unless, of course, there's a salad bar, at which point you can go back for seconds at the salad bar. Or, we talked about it, you can eat the food that you bought at the commissary. Breakfast. Breakfast is normally something like Danish cereal, uh, hot cereals, like oatmeal, things like that. It's normally what you're going to see for breakfast. Lunch, lasagna, burritos, tacos. I mean, just, again, normal food. Along with the meal, every inmate gets water and some sort of flavored drink as part of their meal. Uh, flavored drink really is something more like a Kool-Aid, a generic Kool-Aid. Uh, there are, you know, instances where are, there are some fruit juices available for purchase, again, at the commissary, but you get water and something with some flavoring in it. There is milk that's normally available for breakfast only. How do the meals get made? Okay, every prison has its own meal facility where all the meals are prepared by inmates and they're supervised by uh, prison personnel, guards basically, that have been specifically trained in food service. So every meal is apportioned to a specific proportion Every meal is counted out. Everybody gets a scoop of this and two of these or whatever the case may be. And the inmates make it and they then serve it to the rest of the inmates, whoever's not working, obviously, 
in the, uh, in the kitchen. Bathrooms. Bathrooms vary a lot based on the different classifications. Yes, if we go into medium and high security prisons, there is a stainless steel, you know, commode and a sink attached to the wall. It is inside of the cell and the cellmates use the toilet and the sink that is provided for them. Now, as you kind of move down in classification, especially in minimum, most of the time a bathroom is one of two things. It is either a a commode inside of the uh, the dormitory room where there is a curtain or some sort of you know privacy screening that exists and you know the roommates between themselves will kind of figure out when you can use a bathroom so it's kind of prison etiquette to not you know go number two while everybody's sitting you know in on their bunk playing cards uh, unless it's an emergency but you know those are those are rules that the inmates amongst themselves kind of make up just to make life easier on everybody if you don't have a specific commode and a sink inside of your dormitory room, they have a latrine I would consider like, you know, in a college dorm, there is a bathroom and there are a number of stalls for showers. There are a number of stalls for toilets. Normally there are no doors, but there are at least some sort of, uh, you know, side curtains or, or barriers. Again, just for a mild amount of personal privacy. Realize it's still prison. So, you know, you can't, you know, close the door and lock it and, and, and sit in the bathroom for an hour and a half reading a magazine. Let's take a minute and talk about an inmate's communication with the outside world. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the phone and there are phone privileges. You can actually contact your, um, your loved ones. Normally, the prisons get, uh, require you to give them a list of about 30 or so people that are vetted by the Bureau of Prisons. Each person, they do a background check to make sure they know what's going on. Every phone call that comes from the Bureau of Prisons is recorded and it will start with, this is a phone call from a federal prison this line is being recorded or something like that. Everything is recorded and it's kept. Other than that, there is the opportunity for written mail. So yes, you can write letters, you can buy stamps and paper and envelopes at the commissary. You can write letters to your friends and family members. There's normally a 10 letter per day limit. And what happens is every piece of mail that goes out of a prison and every piece of mail that comes into a prison is going to be opened and read and search for contraband, except any letter that is on a law firm letterhead and has a annotation on the back which says, legal mail, open in inmates' presence only. And what'll happen in that circumstance is, uh, let's just say I wrote Elizabeth Holmes' letter as her lawyer, she would be called down to her case manager's office, they would open the letter in her presence, they will open it to make sure there's no contraband or anything inside of it that's inappropriate. And then, then they will put the letter back in and give it to her because the prison does not read legal mail because there are attorney client confidentiality provisions that still apply even when you're incarcerated. But for everybody else, they open it, they read it, they search it for contraband. And let me just tell you, some of these facilities are very, very good at how they search. They have black lights. They look for patterns in words to see if somebody is sending encoded messages. They look to see if somebody has dissolved, for example, drugs and place it on the paper so that the inmate can then dissolve the paper inside of some liquid and, and have the drugs available to them. They're very sophisticated in how they check for contraband. Other than that, the Bureau of Prisons does have an email service. It is called TrueLinks. And the way this works is, the Bureau of Prisons will give an email account to an inmate. The inmate then will, can provide up to 100 individuals uh, that the Bureau of Prison again, vets to make sure that they know who is communicating back and forth with the Bureau of Prisons. Those emails, of course, are not confidential. They are read, they are, um, you know, they are monitored. So, you know, they're still not confidentiality, except for lawyers, of course, but the reality is it's an opportunity for inmates every day or so to sit down at the computer and just say, you know, send an email to a friend and receive an email back. Good morale is important, especially for people that are doing long time or hard time, as they call it, because, you know, the more contact you have with the outside world, the better your morale is, the less likely you are to be a problem to the facility and to the people that are monitoring you, i.e. the guards. So other than just, you know, the communication that you would receive outside of prison, there is visitation inside of the Bureau of Prisons. And visitation looks like this. In order for you to receive a visit at the Bureau of Prisons, 
you have to provide their name, they have to be vetted, meaning they do a background to make sure this person is somebody that can be at the prison. There are requirements of people that come into the prison. For example, there are requirements on modesty of clothing. For example, you can't show up in a bikini and want to go inside the federal prison. They're not going to allow it. You have to wear clothing. And, and some of these facilities are very specific. You can't show shoulders. Shorts can't be shorter than you know mid-thigh or above the knee or whatever the case may be. Um, they talk about all the things that can and cannot be brought and worn into the prison. Once the person is vetted, uh, they make an appointment. There is a system that allows you to make an appointment. They then are, come into the prison. They're scanned and screened, meaning they go through the metal detector and they check for contraband again, so that people are not bringing in things that are not allowed in the prison inside. At which point you basically sit there and you can talk either at the tables inside of the visitation center. Some facilities, like I said, camps and minimum security facilities have picnic tables. And you just go out in the back and sit at the picnic table and you know talk to your loved ones for however long your visitation time is. We had a question last time uh, on the video about conjugal visits. And what conjugal visits means is visits with spouses for intimate contact. Let's put it that way. The Bureau of Prisons does not allow for conjugal visits. There is no place where you, your wife can come or your husband can come and you can have an intimate setting uh, and spend the night with them. It doesn't work that way. So those do not exist in federal prison at all. Again, visitation's pretty liberal. I mean, realize again, you're in prison. Uh, I think you are allowed to have visitation and depends on your classification, however many times per month. Sometimes it can be weekly, sometimes it's monthly. But again, it's you're allowed to see people at regular intervals. They're allowed to come into the prison. And as long as they're not disruptive, it's normally not a problem. As you progress in your prison sentence, and we've talked about Elizabeth Holmes specifically, you know, the truth is she scores off the chart on the sentencing guideline. Could she receive 20 years? Absolutely. Do I think that the judge may give her a sentence lower than 20 years? It's possible. But regardless, I don't think she's going to serve less than you know, 10 years. Let's just use a round number. So you know, when you're in prison for 10 to 20 years, a lot changes over the course of time. The Bureau of Prisons has something called a furlough program. And for those of you that don't know, what a furlough means is that you as an inmate are actually allowed to leave the prison for a number of reasons. For example, if you have a critically ill family member, if a family member dies and you know, you're going to go to the funeral, if you need some sort of special medical attention, if there's some religious or work-related activity that is going on, you may be allowed to either go to wherever that place may be outside of the prison, um, either uh, with an escort from the prison, or in some circumstances, especially as you get towards the end of your prison sentence, they may just let you go by yourself. And again, if you're in a minimum security pr uh, prison and you've got a year left on your sentence, most of these people will not risk uh, screwing up their classification. So they'll go to wherever they've got to go and they will come back. Uh, so that does exist. It is something that happens. It's not, I don't want you to think that this is something that happens often. It is not like an everyday occurrence, but it does happen, especially as you get closer to the end of your sentence. Now, for those guys in the supermax prisons, mom dies, you know, it's too bad. They're probably not going to furlough you. May they give you an opportunity to go, you know, and be part of that uh, funeral? I, I doubt it. They're probably going to let you video it and they may, you know, give you opportunity to sit in front of the video screen and watch you know, funeral, but they're not going to let you go. So again, understand that furloughs are few and far between, and those furloughs are really for very special events, but they do occur. All right, let's take a minute and talk about how your gain time, that's the official term, is scored at the Bureau of Prisons. Again, you have your case manager, and your case manager, one of the things that they do is they manage your gain time. And what gain time is, is there is a credit towards your sentence. Now, there is no such thing as parole in the federal system since, I believe, 1987. Parole was abolished. What you can do, though, is um, you have the right to have certain credits towards your sentence, presuming that you act well, you don't have any you know, disciplinary issues, and you can get up to 54 days per year of credit for each year that you're in prison. What that really breaks down to is this. We say that you will serve approximately 85% of your prison sentence in the Bureau of Prisons. So if you're sentenced to 10 years, you will serve eight and a half years actually in the prison. If you have your gain time, you know that will take care of the rest. 
Your last six months are normally somewhere in what we call a halfway house, also known as a reintegration facility, uh, where they kind of get you back into being a civilian where you show up, you know, you'll go to work, come back, and you'll stay in the halfway house for about six months. There are some other programs that if you participate in them, you know, it may take some time off your sentence. For example, there is an intensive drug program, which is a number of months. It's kind of like a boot camp, a military style boot camp that cuts about a year off your sentence. So there are a number of things that could potentially take off time from your total prison sentence. But as a rule of thumb, you'll serve 85% of that time in the Bureau of Prisons. Now, uh, we talked about part of Elizabeth Holmes' sentence will be financial. And what that means is she'll have a fine, she'll have restitution, and she will have something called a special assessment. It's normally $100 per count of conviction. The Bureau of Prisons does collect money from inmates that have uh, financial uh, obligations. What they'll normally do is they'll take a portion out of your commissary account, they will take a portion of the monies that you make in your Unicor job, or they'll make arrangements with the inmate themselves to make financial restitution. And you're gonna tell me, why would you wanna do that? Well, I'll tell you why. If you participate as an inmate in the financial responsibility program, it will help your chances of being part of a number of things. For example, it will help you for eligibility for better housing. It will help your eligibility for better job assignments. It will allow you to be eligible for certain activities, for certain sporting events, for furloughs, and it'll take it'll be taken into consideration when you ask for a custody level change. And remember, as you go through your time, you can request adjustments to where you are housed to be in less restrictive facilities. Now, if you don't participate in the financial responsibility program, a lot of those things are not available to you, or uh, your ability to apply for these programs is kind of set behind all the people that are participating. Now, let's be real. I don't know what her, you know, total losses are, 500 million, 900 million, whatever the number is, whatever they find out, she's not going to ever pay that through the Bureau of Prisons. So, you know, as long as she's participating in some way, shape or form, and she's making arrangements, they're, you know, they're going to give her credit for that. Other than that, that's pretty much a day in the life of what Bureau of Prisons intake and life is like. So you tell me what you think. How do you think Elizabeth Holmes will do in prison? Listen, we all know she's most likely going to prison and we mo all, I think, recognize that she very well might go to prison for a long time. Do you think she will adapt well? Uh, do you think she will participate in these programs? What types of activities do you think that she will find interesting uh, You know, in her extracurricular life? You think she'll be on the softball team? You think she'll make copper pots? I don't know. Do you think she'll be part of the, um, the Unicorn job that produces or repairs military vehicles? I don't know. You tell me what you think. But for now, we're going to wrap it up. And thank you for watching. Again, if you like the video, thumbs up. If you're enjoying the series, please subscribe. And as always, questions and comments down below. See you next time. Thanks for watching this episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you like this content, please share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like our videos. If you want some interaction, get in the comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. If you want to know any more information about our firm or this page, you can find out in the description or visit tragoslaw.com. We post multiple times throughout the week, so make sure you hit that bell so you can get the notification and not miss out on the next episode.